like to thank Mine Yours Ours for inviting me here. It's uh, very exciting actually to be in Rijeka because as part of the research for this project, I have traveled on a couple of very large container ships and all of the officers on those container ships were from Rijeka, uh, the captains and the mates. And so it's very exciting to be in a city um, where I've spoke, which I've spoken about for so long. Um, I also want to thank Tommy for inviting me, for being involved in my invitation, and thank all of you for being here on a Friday night. Um, now, my talk is going to be slightly different than the introduction Tommy gave and uh, the stuff that Jasper is going to be talking about, because what I'm going to be talking about is going to be very specific to the Middle East, which is my area of research, and it is going to be more about the development of infrastructures, ports, and the sort of the, the uh, hardware, essentially, on which uh, logistics mar maritime stuff runs. Among the holdings of the British Museum, warehoused in their massive storage among around 8 million objects, is a carved dark gravestone, which is inscribed in Hebrew and it's dated from 1333 AD, so it's about 800 years old. And it's from the port of Aden in Yemen. The inscription on the stone says, Mayest thou rest in peace until the Redeemer cometh. In the month of Tebeth, in the year 1333, was gathered in peace to her fathers, the worthy, respected woman, Madmia, the daughter of Sadia, the son of Abraham. May his memory be blessed. This stone, which is, as I said, 800 years old, was donated to the British Museum in 1886, so about 150 years ago by Thomas Holdsworth Newman of the shipping firm Mr. Newman Hunt and Company of London. The stone, interestingly, had been brought to Britain 30 years earlier, so around 1856, where it had been used as a ballast in a ship. Ballast is the weight that keeps the ship, the ship in balance. But the, but the grave, uh, the gravestone had been looted from uh, Aden, and it had been used as a ballast for a ship that had been sailing from India to Zanzibar and then onwards to Britain. I've tried to find out what the ship was carrying, but I've not been successful. The shipping firm itself, uh, Mr. Uh, Newman Hunt and Company, owned whaling ships in Newfoundland in Canada and owned vineyards in Oporto in Portugal, and also traded with Mediterranean ports. There's a lot that I would like to note about this object. First, it speaks of the long history of Jewish presence in Aden in Yemen. It speaks of imperial carelessness that plunders gravestones for ballast. And it points to Aden as a significant, at that point perhaps the most significant, coaling station between Europe and India coaling for ships, fueling for ships. I want to say a few words about ballast, and then I shall shift to Aden itself. In his beautiful short reflection on ships' ballasts, Charlie Haley recalls that Joseph Conrad, the author, was completely and utterly obsessed with ballast, constantly telling us about the ships in, that appear in his stories, about whether or not they were in cargo or in ballast, and where the weight in this instance of stone, but later of coal and still later of seawater and oil, is required to balance the ship when the ship is low on cargo. Landscapes were harvested of ballast, looted clean of sand and shingle and rock. And although ballast may speak of empty ships, of ships that have delivered their goods in one direction and are now sailing in the opposite direction with their cargo heaved to port, it also speaks of resource extraction in ways that would be considered unproductive, but which are fundamental to capitalist trade. This resource extraction transformed landscapes in ways that have been forgotten. Once a ship arrived in port, ballast had to be discarded. This sh shingle, sand, rock, stones had to be discarded. And despite laws that prevented the discharging of stone and shingle and sand into the sea, Haley tells us that discarded ballast spawned landscapes born of displaced materials from far-flung lands. So there's a ballast hill in Seattle in, uh, in the U.S., and another one in Newcastle, 
in uh, the UK. And ballast islands and hills, this wastage itself became infrastructure with those unwitting spoils of trade repurposed for buildings, roads, and railways. In fact, in the UK, a lot of the sand, the pebbles that are used on the old railways was ballast that were brought over from other places, from other ports in the world. Today, when seawater from one geography is released in port in another geography, there is much concern about invasive species, about this uncanny mixing of water, organisms, and pollution. And the harvesting and dumping of ballast also echoes through the dredging and land reclamation processes that today transform landscapes. For example, in the case of um, Singapore, Singapore has over the course of the last 150 years added something, uh, in the course of the last 100 years, have, has added about 150% to its land mass, a vast majority of which is actually logistical space, so ports, roads, and that kind of stuff. And the, the concrete that is required for this process of land reclamation requires a particular kind of sand. This particular kind of sand can't be desert sand because desert sand is too fine and it has been eroded by the wind. And so all of the grains of the sand are equal in size. What you need is river sand, but river sand is very difficult to find. So for example, in the case of Singapore, in order for them to expand this land reclamation out into the sea, they have looted the entire riverbeds of the country of Myanmar, formerly Burma, to the point that ancient marine topographies in Myanmar have been ripped up to accommodate ships in Singapore, but also in this case, uh, ripped up in Myanmar to bring sand to Singapore for port reconstruction. And of course, this causes flooding in Myanmar and ecological disasters there. The making of ports and transport, infra transport infrastructure in one place then requires the despoilation of another place. A port in Singapore or Dubai requires the ecological devastation of another country's riverbeds. I think ballast is crucial in thinking about shipping precisely because it reminds us that the movement of ships across the seas is not simply about the movement of cargo or about production and circulation, or at least it doesn't stop there. That the ostensible routes of trade also map geographies of empire and of new physical landscapes, of new forms of labor and rule, of remade ecologies, and of course, of forms of imperial hierarchy which see nothing in using a 600-year-old gravestone of a young Jewish woman as a weight to keep the ship in equilibrium. But this story also reminds us of the central, centrality of empire with its tentacles of violence, with its narratives of security, and with the ways in which trade routes and military logistics networks seem to very comfortably overlay one another. In so doing, I want to talk about Aden in Yemen. And I do so because the rise and fall of Aden, at once the most important, uh, which was once the most important port of the Middle East, and today it's a destroyed backwater, lacerated by bombs and missiles and siege, also says something about other ghostly presences of empire and imperial forms in today's logistics. Now these uh, cranes are familiar to us and they actually could be interchangeable. Uh, the sublime aesthetics, the awe and terror of logistical landscapes, all those extraordinary vast ports with their cranes reaching to the sky and the puzzle pieces of containers stacked in asymmetrical mountains often conjure up an irrevocable rupture from the past heralding something new, as yet unseen, as a kind of threshold of transformation in the character of capitalism. We hear about an age of logistics or technologies of circulation and automation that remake the world in ways not yet seen. I don't deny the awe I feel when moving through these logistical landscapes, with transport infrastructures ma mapping not only what is, but what goes and what becomes. I admit that whenever I visit a port city, the first thing I do is organize a tour of the industrial harbors and look for the palimpsest of histories of trade in the crumbling wharves or the sleek and streamlined container terminals. Um, often when I'm traveling with my children and we go to a port city, they know that the first thing they're gonna have to do is come with me on a tour of the port. It really annoys them, but they've become accustomed to it. I confess that flying over busy straits, say Bosporus, 
or Malacca or Gibraltar, that extraordinary traffic in ships, especially in the long, sleek tankers and the behemoth container ships, exhilarates me. But despite the feeling of newness in this aesthetic sublime, these logistical landscapes, both at land and at sea, are haunted by theirs and our colonial pasts. In what remains here, I will reflect on these hauntings through a consideration of the emergence and decline of ports and maritime transport infrastructures in the Arabian Peninsula and especially Aden. Whether it's route making and enduring transoceanic connections of labor and trade and war, or it is the geography of ports and inland transportation crossroads and hubs, today's transportation sector echoes colonial pasts. Aden was conquered in 1839 by British warships from the British governorate of Bombay in India, which used the excuse of a ship's grounding and outrage against that, woman's, uh, that ship's women passengers to open fire on the port of Aden and eventually annex it. So this was in 1839. By then, the East India Company had lost its monopoly on trade in India and China and urgently needed to gain upper hand in commerce. Therefore, it required Aden as a coaling station on its sea route from India to Suez. And uh, at that point, the Suez Canal had not been constructed yet, so the ships went to Suez, and then they went overland to Alexandria, and then got on the ships again. As the city became a crucial possession of the empire, one of the most important coaling stations in the world, and especially after the opening of the Suez Canal in 1869, Aden could easily be considered the most significant port in the Arab world east of Suez. Um, it's uh, at some point, uh, both with coal and later with oil, it was considered to be the fourth largest, fourth most important uh, refueling station for ships after New York, London, and Liverpool. With coal depots came inland trade, and as Om Barak has written, railways, tramways, telegraph, water pumps, which facilitated movement and operation of policemen, judges, inoculation officials, and irrigation inspectors deep into Aden and the hinterland. Aden was so significant an outpost that many a well-known well uh, writer and poet actually went to, from Europe to Aden to earn a living as functionaries and merchants. So, for example, the famous French poet Arthur Rimbaud worked as a coffee trader in Aden and lived in a house that at the time faced the sea, but which in vast projects of land reclamation in the intervening years is now buried deep in land about a kilometer from the sea. Some decades later, the great Paul Nizan, another French um, author, who had run away to Aden in his uh, late 20s and early th 30s, wrote of the transformation in the commodities of trade that also transformed the infrastructures of Aden. He wrote, and I'm quoting at length because it's so beautiful, he says, not so long ago, he's writing in the 1930s now, not so long ago, Aden was a coaling station. Oil brought with it its offices, docks, the blank tanks of the Anglo-Persian and Asiatic petroleums, and intrigues that roused the emotions of the potentates who have become sellers of oil and buyers of gasoline for automobiles. A little war for concessions is spreading all around. In Arabia, the smell of leather and the smell of oil that grows more insolent every month are replacing the smell of coffee from Sana'a and Harar. As with coffee, so with oil. To extend coffee plantations, European wars have been undertaken, vast territories have been conquered in the New World, in Africa and in the Sunda Islands, millions of slaves have been captured and transported to the new plantations, a revolution has been accomplished, entailing consequences incalculable in their complexity, in which good and evil are intermingled, in which frauds, warfare, oppression, wholesale massacres go hand in hand with commercial enterprise. The wisdom of nations approves of all this scheming and contracting and forcing all this profitable slavery. He was a really great writer. This intertwining of war, commerce, and transit, as Nissan called it, has continued. Aden was, until Britain was forced to abandon India, still a major way station. In fact, it was its um, most significant uh, naval base east of the Mediterranean. 
And even after 1947, when uh, the Brit uh, Britain was forced to abandon India, Aden was still considered to be an outpost of empire, guaranteeing Wayne and British supremacy over trade routes that brought oil and commodities to a war-devastated Europe. It was only a bloody rebellion in the 1960s that finally, they pushed, that finally pushed the British out of Aden in 1967, with 1968 being the only year in the entirety of the 20th century when the British were not fighting a war somewhere in the world. Just one year in the entire 20th century where the British weren't fighting war. Over 100 years later, and in the aftermath of the bloody civil war of 1994, a hundred years after the conquest, Aden became once again a commercial prize. This time, the conquest occurred not by warships, but by capital. And interestingly, not capital from Europe or North America, but first by parastatal capital from Singapore and later parastatal capital from Dubai. The contract that gave Dubai Ports World, which is now the fourth largest port terminal management company in the world, control over the container terminals at Aden is said to have been secured through bribes to the then president of Yemen, Ali Abdullah Saleh. Now, he has been deposed and is fighting a war of control for Yemen. There was a swirl of rumors and a rank of stories around the port of Aden under the control of Dubai Ports World and how Dubai Ports World was managing it. But it has become clear since then that Dubai Ports World took over the port and then tried to redirect the port traffic to other ports it operated nearby, including Djibouti, from which DP World has also been ejected, and especially Jabal Ali in Dubai itself. Now, one of the reasons for this is this. Aden, which is here, has one of the deepest harbors and one of the most easily navigable harbors in all of the Arabian Peninsula. It's very close on the trading route to the Indian Ocean and very close to Suez. Jabal Ali is up there where Dubai is. Right there. Sorry, I'm very short. Um, and, uh, and Jabal Ali, in order to get to it, obviously you have to go all around the Arabian Peninsula. But also the harbor is not a natural harbor and has to be constantly dredged. It has a very shallow channel which has to be constantly dredged in order to accommodate ships that are getting larger and larger and deeper and deeper every day. And not only that, the, the Persian Gulf has one of the most unstable um, subsea floors with lots of currents that constantly shift the sand around. So the constant dredging is needed. So in some senses, Jabal Ali needs a lot more capital investment in order to keep it being the sort of the major port that it continues being in comparison with somewhere like Aden, which has a natural harbor. So everybody that I have spoken to that has had anything to do with the port of Aden tells me that, in fact, Dubai Ports World did intentionally run down the port of Aden in order to redirect traffic to Jabal Ali. That Aden would be targeted for such subterfuge is not surprising. Its natural deep harbor and excellent location make it a more inviting proposition than Jabal Ali, whose harbors require constant dredging and maintenance, and access to which requires passage through the Strait of Hormuz. That DP World engaged in such subterfuge in such a brazen and shameless way, and that the government of Yemen eventually withdrew the company's contract are perhaps more of a surprise. But in that maneuvering also, there was something of the colonial com company maneuverings. I mean, Dubai Ports World, the way that they drew up the contract, the bribery that was involved in it, the way that they got it on uh, every way, that they did actually weirdly reflected the way the old colonial companies did business. Of concessions and contracts and monopolies rested by force, and of contracts being considered provisional as far as profit and power are concerned. Today, Aden's port lies in ruin after a war waged on the country by Saudi Arabia and its allies, including the United Arab Emirates, the home of Dubai Ports World. In the swirl of conspiracy theories, one hears that part of the reason for the war is Saudi Arabia's stoking of sectarian wars, but also of access to routes to the Indian Ocean for the transport of oil. This conspiracy theory comes about because 
there was a WikiLeaks leak of Saudi document in which they were arguing for routes to the Indian Ocean directly either through Oman or through Yemen. But as likely as scenarios, also the destruction of Yemen's transport infrastructure in favor of competing ports on the Red Sea, for example, Saudi's King Abdullah port, and the Persian Gulf, Jabal Ali. There are even rumors today that the revival of the port of Aden will depend on it being incorporated into the networks of trade that Dubai Ports World ties together throughout and beyond the region. So there's conversation again about Dubai Ports World going in. This brass knuckles violent form of geopolitical economy is unsurprising given the ways in which dream worlds of strategy are imagined and layers of power. And Aden is considered to be a strategic stronghold, not only for trade, but for military expansion across the East. In a different context, in his magnificent Moby Dick, Herman Melville has written about how commercial whaling and conquest went hand in hand. He writes, if American and European warships now peacefully ride in one savage harbors, let them fire salutes to the honor and glory of the whale ship which originally showed them the way and first interpreted between them and the savages. So the whale, wherever the whale ships went, so did the navies of uh, the US and Europe. Much the same could be said of the ships of the East India Company. Where they went, the empire followed. The inextricability of commercial and military aims, of course, is crucial to the government of both state and commerce and of the seas. Now, take a look at that map. And look at the, it, the density of the routes in the Pacific of the whaling ships. And then look at this map, which is a map of the annexations of islands in the Pacific. And in fact, those maps, the density of those routes, very nicely overlay one another. When in the last couple of years I have traveled on container ships from Malta to Dubai, I have to confess to being overwhelmed with awe for the sublime sea, with fascination with the vast behemoth of machinery carrying me and thousands of tons of goods in the seas. Standing on the deck and looking out to the Mediterranean or the Red Sea or the Indian Ocean made me want to think of the sea as something eternal, transcendental and grand. And yet the sea is made by humans as much as land is. Underwater cables, for example, crisscross seabeds. And as a fabulous new book by Nicole Starosielski tells us, this geography of undersea networks contains histories of cable laying, militarization, and economic deprivation, where new modes of spatial organization have led to the displacement of local residents, closure and enclosure of vast public spaces, and a reorganization of racialized labor regimes. It has always struck me that the way to think about the sea as a geography is to think of the sea not only as this three-dimensional space with palimpsest of power embedded therein, but also to think of the sea as history, as the poet Derek Walcott has asked us to. This means that history includes the invisible roots of trade that connect long-standing bonds of commerce and trust from coast to coast the three-dimensional layers of human labor, which includes cables and shipping channels, but also bones of sailors, soldiers, slaves, indentured workers, and migrants. History strangely shows us the consistency of the maps of war and trade across centuries. Today what is fascinating is the extent to which these maps of trade, communication, and transport are also maps that can be overlain by the cartography of US military presence in the Middle East. The utter embedding of US military and its malign guardianship of these routes through the control of the sea lanes and the littorals, the coasts, is only one part of a very specific form of securitization of the seas. This is a map of the US uh, bases and as you can see the vast density of it is on coastal areas and also on islands through the, through the oceans. Not only that is universal, though of course many states have a naval presence in some of the more sensitive areas. It's a kind of presence, a kind of legal power, a kind of infrastructural capacity that can only still emanate from a world metropole whose, de whose demise is far too often predicted far too soon. Ports are strategic assets. Commercial ships can be commandeered to haul material and personnel for war fighting, 
logistics firms become warfighting machines and adjuncts of military logistics operations. In the Middle East, for example, the uh, biggest client of DHL, all of you guys know DHL, the, the, um, tr uh, the courier company, their single biggest client is the United States military. And whenever, for example, the US draws down or pushes in its troops somewhere, the HL has to hire something like tens of thousands of people in order to be able to accommodate the demands of the US to bring in bullets or tanks or goods or food or God knows what. This has been true in every war fought by the US in the Middle East. The US Army Corps of Engineers has been crucial in construction not only of ports and dams and roads in the United States, but throughout the world. In Saudi Arabia, in Oman, and in the Gulf, the engineering expertise of the US military has gone into the creation of a vast infrastructure of civilian transport that can be quickly and easily transformed into a war fighting asset. And when the war is done, or done temporarily, these war fighting assets can be transformed again into instruments of capitalist trade and commerce. As Deborah Cowan has described in her extraordinary book on the deadly life of logistics, U.S. bases and detention centers uh, in Umar Ghazar in Iraq or in the Philippines are transmuted into logistic city. I think this one in particular is very interesting. Camp Bakka was one of three major camps in which the U.S. military held detainees during the Iraq war. Camp Bakka was known particularly for the brutality of its treatment of detainees. And in fact, the guy who claims to be the caliph of ISIS, the head of ISIS, was apparently held and radicalized in Camp Bakka. Camp Bakka also, since the end of the war, has been changed, as Deb Cowan tells us, has been changed into Basra Logistics City. So there is a way in which this detention center really comfortably and easily became a logistics city uh, in Iraq. But also in the Philippines, the Clark Air Force Base, which was a major colonial holding of the United States throughout the 20th century, has been turned into a logistics city. This fungibility, exchangeability, of the military and commercial functions of infrastructure is of course nothing new. And roads, markets, and schools were the holy trinity of colonial pacification through the 19th century. As far back as the colonial conquest, uh, the French colonial conquest of Algeria in the 1830s, Marshal Bugot would write about the construction of roads as not only conduits of cavalry, but also as routes for trade and civilization, which were in, uh, crucial to the pacification of intransigent and backward natives. So the roads served two functions. They were on the one hand commercial and they brought capital, but on the other hand, they were also very usable to send cavalry down them to pacify the natives. But the sovereign form of control over trade routes needs the gunship only some of the time. What is most striking about the logistical landscape and the entities that forged them is the structural and political qualities of these entities, these corporations, which on so many different levels seem to be haunted by the sovereign corporate form of the East India Company and other colonial company, the Dutch East India Company, the French East India Company, etc. These corporate forms are not only about the management of resources, extraction of resources, or allocation of resources, commodities, goods, markets, but they're also about extension of particular regimes of private property across the surface of the globe. So for example, where East India Company goes, a particular liberal capitalist notion of private property and legal rules go with it. And what is interesting is that our modern corporate forms very much serve the same function. These, uh, these kinds of corporate forms are also about the structuring of ownership, dispossession, and exploitation through a series of legal apparatuses that even in the face of cacophonous discourses of independence from the state or calls for small government, are ultimately about the corporations working in tandem with the states and its police and military force for the making of the world around it. This is particularly true of the varieties of corporate bodies that support shipping today, precisely because of the size and capital intensity of the sector.
corporatized port authorities, private or public private terminal operators, shipping firms, construction firms, including dredging experts. All of these corporations um, are, are actually incredibly capital intensive. Let's not forget that maritime infrastructure and logistics involve vast legal scaffoldings, property ownership and land tenure regimes and laws, maritime access laws, nautical boundaries, undersea topographical control, and so on. A corporation which acts for or instead of or alongside the state can address the complexities of uh, this sort of legal landscape and benefits from the shadowy boundary between the state and the supposedly private sector. Because on the one hand, it's private, it doesn't have to have public scrutiny. But because it has a very close relationship to the state, it can receive as much funding as it can from the public purse. And this is true, as true uh, of Dubai or a place like that as it is actually of the European uh, countries where these big corporations involved in maritime infrastructure, shipping, etc., benefit from state subsidies on a vast scale. This residue of the mercantilist era, the corporate form, and the professional militaries that secure their free trade throughout the world belies the standard classic narrative of classical uh, capitalism, which is all about separation of state and capital. This simultaneity of state and corporate coimbrication, the way that they're wrapped together, is which is characteristic of mercantilism, really coexists with the fantasy of free trade and laissez-faire policies, which are ultimately secured by state, police, and standing army or navy. I can't but think of this colonial past when I, for example, see uh, the Troika's pressure on Greece to privatize its ports. So Piraeus is now owned by the Chinese or the German parastatal corporation Fraport, which has now taken control of Greece's air cargo and regional airport infrastructures. It is also, however, important to recognize that although a vast amount of the capital and control and colonial impulse, uh, although a lot of it still emanates from Northwest Atlantic, capital accumulation in specific regions, and here I'm thinking of Dubai, Singapore, Hong Kong, and other cities like that, also extend their repressive regimes of control and exploitation to various ports near and far. Again, I want to talk about Dubai Ports World uh, because I think they're particularly interesting. They have taken over two ports in Northwest Europe, one London Gateway and another uh, in Rotterdam, Rotterdam Gateway. And since taking over London Gateway, they have refused to recognize or negotiate with any local unions. And of course, London is such a neoliberal state, they've been quite happy to do that. In Rotterdam, Rotterdam has forced them to recognize the union. But what Dubai Ports World has done is it has tried to bring its regime of control of the workers that it has in Dubai and elsewhere with it to Europe. In imperial conditions, this blurred line between the corporation and the sovereign state, or the empire, becomes even more instrumentally vague and opaque. The East India Company, in some senses, is an excellent predecessor for many of the companies that have been crucial in the construction of logistical infrastructures. Ports, coaling stations, shipping channels, harbors, shipping agencies, or factories as they were called, military offices, and on and on and on, were side effects of the East India Company's exploitation. It is precisely the intensity and volume of investment required to support shipping and trade that allows for the flourishing of these corporations as arms of the state. And it is the infrastructure required in the colonies that leads to the development of railroads, roads, ports, warehouses, and urban expanses. What is hugely important is that the construction of these transport and logistical infrastructures is not always the job of transport and logistics businesses, and I think it's really important to recognize this. I have been struck, for example, by the extent to which the transport and other kinds of infrastructure in the vast majority of the Arabian Peninsula has been developed as part of the profit-making by perhaps two of the most important companies on the peninsula historically. One of them is British Petroleum, and the other one is Aramco of Saudi Arabia. 
In both instances, these petroleum companies actually had to construct cargo ports first in order to unload goods required to build oil infrastructures, plants, wells, refineries, and oil terminals. In both BP and Aramco's case, the respective militaries of Britain and the US were from the very beginning mobilized to defend these supposedly private corporations. Both these companies had larger or smaller development programs in the countries in which they worked, and which was predicated on improving the health and education of a population that could then serve as workers for the company. So education was significant, and they had big education programs, but the education was entirely technical, so that the workers could actually work on the plants, but nothing beyond that. Both BP and Aramco's work was also predicated on a form of capitalist class, class formation in which the working population was racialized along the lines of the US or Britain. So in the case of Saudi Arabia, for example, the US brought its Jim Crow regime of separation and apartheid to Saudi Arabia. There were housing for the Arabs and housing for the whites, different kinds of standards of pay and living for both of those categories. And as we know, this articulation of class through race is profoundly characteristic of colonial regimes of capital accumulation. But to go back to logistics and container shipping, if we were to think of shipping and transport of the logistical landscapes as not only the awesome spectacle of container shipping, then it would become clear that without the vast transformation of infrastructures wrought to construct an oil industry or mining in other parts of the world, we wouldn't have many of the cargo ports, rail and road networks, and other forms of transport infrastructure in the Arabian Peninsula, which makes the region an unlikely transportation powerhouse. In this, the colonial echo is clamorous. The transformation of economic, political, social, and physical landscapes, and especially labor relations, are fundamental to the profit-making ventures of these imperial corporations. As Bruce Robbins has written, Infrastructure needs to be made visible in order for us to see how our present landscape is the product of past projects and past struggles. Thank you very much.